Thanks, Justin. I tried to think of a, a title for this message and couldn't really think of very smart title, so I think you can just call it what you want or I think or just a Cain and Cain and Seth. We're talking about two separate lines here from Adam and Eve. Um, and our series title is God's Character and Man's Rebellion. But if we had another chance, I think I would suggest naming it first Man's Rebellion, then God's Character. The reason why I would suggest this is because that we can know God's character more deeper uh, and in a personal way because of our rebellion. Of course, we can know a lot about God through creation itself. This is a general revelation. We can know about God's omnipotence, his unfathomable wisdom, his unbounded creativity, his incomprehensible knowledge, just by observing creation. Uh, and if Adam and Eve and everyone after them never sinned, what would our world really be like? How would we know that God hates sin? How would we know that God is holy? We would all have a relationship with him, and that would be perfect, right? But I'm thinking it would be a little bit different than our relationship with him is now. We would know that he is glorious, but to what extent would we know about his glory? We would know that he is holy, and God would be different than us, sure. But if we always obeyed him, how much more different would he be from us than, of course, his great power and wisdom? But morally, we may not see much of a difference between us and him, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't know how much he hates rebellion. Uh, we would also know that he loves us since we would be in perfect, unbroken relationship with him. We all naturally love those who never hurt us and offend us, right? And God, of course, would too. But would we really know how much God loves us? How do we know God loves us? Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ sh demonstrated his love by dying for us sinners who were rebellion, in rebellion against him. And then in Luke uh, 7, 47, we see the verse that says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, little loves little. Would we love God less if we weren't forgiven? And in 1 John 4, 19 says, but we love because he first loved us. So since God demonstrated his love, we can experience and know how much he loves us and then return that love to him. Would that kind of world, if no one ever sinned, display who God really is completely? Would it display the whole of God's glory? Would it display God's heart for his own glory? Would that kind of man, a God-man relationship display how much he loved us? Would that kind of world display how holy God is and how much greater he is than us? Would that kind of world display how much God hates rebellion? and how gracious and how merciful he truly is? And I believe the answers to those questions are no. Of course, we just speculate what would happen if, if no one ever sinned. But we can understand that God uses man's rebellion, even though man is completely responsible for his rebellion. God uses that rebellion to reveal himself in a greater way, in a way which we don't just know about God, but we can know him and experience him more completely. So knowing the extent of man's rebellion and our rebellion gives us an opportunity to know and experience firsthand the greatness of our God and his character. 
And throughout redemptive history, we can see man's depravity as it is exposed. And then God comes onto the scene more and more to reveal himself more and more. There is the first Adam, and then comes Jesus, referred to as the second Adam. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see that the fall, we see the fall of man, and then a glimpse of God's plan to save humanity and crush Satan. Everything is going from darkness to light as God progresses through history in revealing his plan until Jesus comes to fulfill all things in his life and then there on the cross. We can see this idea of darkness to life, to light, even in Genesis 1 when God creates the earth. Do you remember how God calls a day? He says, there was evening and then there was morning. Morning is not first evening. And the Jewish culture still holds to this as their day starts in the evening before ours. And I say this because this, in this text also we see kind of man's rebellion and depravity in the first part of this section. And then as we continue toward the end, we see God coming on the scene and God working behind everything. Today we will briefly look at three points of man's rebellion and we are facing the same ungodliness today. And then we will look to see God and his character working behind the scenes in these verses. So in the first couple of verses, we can see the line of Cain. In verse 17, it says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of that city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mahushael, and Mahushael fathered Mathushael, and Mathushael fathered Lamech. And the biggest question many people ask about these verses is, where did Cain's wife come from? I think the answer is Cain married his sister. But uh, we have to be a little bit careful in Genesis here. It doesn't tell us every detail of every story. So just because it doesn't talk about Adam and Eve not having daughters doesn't mean they didn't have daughters. So as we continue in the text, we can begin to see man's rebellion. In verse 19, it says, Lamech took two wives. The name of the first was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Here we can see that Lamech did not follow God's pattern for marriage. God made Adam and Eve to be one in marriage. And we see in Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, not wives, and they shall become one flesh, not three or more becoming one flesh, but one, one man and one woman. And every time we see polygamy in the Bible, uh, we see problems follow. Uh, some of the examples are Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, and their families. We can see lots of strife and even violence. God's plan from the very beginning was for family to have one husband and one wife. We can see the sinfulness of man trying to redefine marriage as early as the seventh generation. And even today, man is trying to redefine marriage and has succeeded as far as some governments are concerned. But to God, marriage will always be between one man and one woman. The sinful nature of man is to take something good from God that he has ordained and pervert it to satisfy their own sinful desires. So first, in, in man's rebellion, we see that uh, man twists God's plan for marriage and tries to redef redefine marriage. And then number two, let's look at the next few verses, uh, no, 23, verses 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wife, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, your wives, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. We do not learn much of the details about what happened here. The Bible 
commentaries explain a few different possibilities. But without reading too much into the story, we can see that uh, Lamech was hit by a guy and then he killed him. There seems to be no expression of remorse in these words. In fact, Lamech seems to be proud. The evidence I see for his pride is, I have three evidences. And the first one is he tells his wives about the incident. Right? Usually if you kill someone, you want to hide what you have done, right? You want to keep it a secret. The next in this section, uh, it actually appears to be a poem or possibly some lyrics. If you see this part in your Bible, it's kind of set aside like maybe the Psalms or something, like in verses. It's like something they would say over and over again. So it appears that he's quite proud about this incident. And then, number three, Lamech shows his pride by presuming upon God's mercy and protection. He says, if God will take vengeance sevenfold for anyone who kills Cain, uh, Lamech thinks he deserves seventy-sevenfold vengeance for anyone who kills him. Why would he think such a thing? Maybe because Cain killed Abel, a completely innocent man, but Lamech, in Lamech's case, Somebody hit him first, so then he killed them. Right? So he, in his pride, he thinks he is justified in killing this man, and he deserves God's protection. So, in re so rebellious man, we see that his pride is growing to the point that he thinks he can live his own life, his own way, and not follow God's uh, plan and he presumes upon God. And what is Lamech proud about? Number three, we see here that man has a dis disregard for the life of other man. In the same verses, we see the disregard of life, the life of others. Lamech thinks he is justified in killing a man because that man hurt him. Right? We see a disregard for life even today. As we heard David Mundy from Women's Hope Center a few weeks ago, he came and uh, said in Korea there are actually more abortions than there are births. And this problem is not just here, but all over the world. Innocent babies are slaughtered in the womb in a variety, for a variety of reasons. Either because the, the baby was a boy or a girl, or because the baby may be sick or even have Down syndrome. And even just a couple of months ago, I think it was in August, the United States TV station, CBS, they reported in Iceland that they are eradicating Down syndrome. But they're not eradicating the number of Down syndrome babies being conceived. They're eradicating the number that are being born, meaning they are murdering the babies with Down syndrome. Society has a disregard from life from the beginning and at the end and everywhere in between. We can see this in our culture even today. So in man's rebellion we see man trying to uh, redefine marriage. We see the pride of man trying to put himself in the place of God judging what is right and wrong and he is actually proud of the things he should be ashamed of. Next, we see a disregard for life, the life of man which was made in God's image. This sounds really close to what is going on today. We are not facing any new issues. So next, let's look at uh, where we see God in, in, these passages, in this passage. We can see God him working behind the scenes, we, we can see God and his character. So first, let's look at verses 20 through 22. Adabor Jabal, and his fa he was the father of those who dwelt in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. 
So this is Cain's line, right? Do we see the fingerprint of God in these verses? Even though man is corrupt and marred with sin, we see that God made man in his image. And we see that a creative God has made creative and industrious and productive man. One of the sons lived in tents and was good with livestock. Another son was a musician, taught his family how to play instruments. This is the first mention of music and instruments. And I reckon if they lived hundreds and hundreds of years, that they would become very skilled playing instruments. And then another son was talented in forging things with bronze and iron. Somehow they learned how to find metal. They learned how to get it and how to make things with it. Just seven generations from Adam and society has progressed a lot. Man made in God's image is really doing amazing things very quickly. And next, number two, we see... Where else do we see God in this passage? Let's look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain had killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Here we see that God has given... Eve, another son in place of Abel, who was murdered. And to Seth was born Enosh. And then it mentions that at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. What does it mean that, that people called upon the name of the Lord? I believe that this shows us two things. So Moses, who penned this part, uh, Genesis, of course, is looking back at what happened. And we see that when someone calls your name, they know you, right? I believe this is saying that people began to have a relationship with God. And when we call upon the Lord, this is prayer, right? Here the Lord is not just Elohim, creator, mighty God, but Jehovah, which is the proper name of God. But actually, we see the name of Jehovah a little bit earlier in Genesis. So why does it say the first to call upon the name of the Lord Jehovah here? Because actually, as Moses is writing this, he is already using the name Jehovah and looking back. And as narrator, he uses Jehovah. But we see whenever Eve says, refers to God, she just uses Elohim, creator God. So they began to use uh, Jehovah, proper name, the proper name of God. And then also we see that the name of the Lord, being Jehovah, that includes all of who he is and his character. Many times in the Bible we can see names like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord has many names that includes all of his character. So when they call upon the name of the Lord, they're calling upon who he really is and what he does. So as we consider calling upon the name of the Lord, we can say that people pursued the relationship with God. They pursued knowing God. They prayed to God. They gave thanks to him and showing, showed him reverence. In a word, we could say they began to worship him. This doesn't mean that people never worshiped him before that, but people began to worship the Lord publicly. Commentators say the emphasis is public worship here. And then we also know that Abraham, over and over again, as God brought him step by step, built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. This is a crying out to God, a humbly crying out to him in worship. It's a special God-centered kind of worship with prayer and thanksgiving. So what significance does this have? Can we pursue or know God on our own? No. Romans says, none is righteous, not, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. 
for to know the Lord, for us to know the Lord, the Lord had to reveal himself to us in a way for us to know him. Then he has to draw us to himself. God was pursuing man even at the very beginning, even from the first sin, before the first sin, and even after the first sin. So man is calling on the name of the Lord, and God is revealing himself. This is associated with the line of Seth, as we see in these verses. In fact, it is through Seth that Noah is born, and eventually Jesus is born, and through whom God reveals himself to us completely and fulfills his plan of redemption. And then number three, what else do we see? How else do we see God's fingerprint in this section? If we look back at verse 25, Eve acknowledges that it is God who appointed Seth to be born, meaning that this is all a part of God's plan. This is not by chance that all of this is happening. And God is in control, and he's working behind the scenes to fulfill what he has uh, willed and what he has promised. Even though we see a lot of sin and godliness in the world, a godlessness in the world, God is working everything to, for his glory and for our good, whom he has called. So let's take a look at the applications. I have three applications here. <clears throat> so notice how in the line of Cain, sin flourished and multiplied. Though it is not recorded here, sin flourished and multiplied everywhere, in every incest line also. So let us come before the Lord in humility and repentance that we may be known as those who call upon the Lord and we may be able to reflect his glory as he had made us to. And then number two, there are two lines in the story. We have the line of Cain and the line of Seth. In the line of Cain, we only know about their sinful lives and then their worldly accomplishments. In the line of Seth, worldly accomplish accomplishments are not recorded. This doesn't mean that they were not good at playing instruments, that they were not good at forging metal like they were in the line of Cain, but the defining characteristic in their line was that they began to call upon the name of the Lord and worship him. What is the defining characteristic of your life? Are you known as a great teacher? Are you known as a great speaker? I'm, I'm not, sorry. Are you known as something else great, or are you known as someone who calls upon the name of the Lord? If someone were to write one line about you, what would they write? Let us live our lives in a way that they would write, he was someone who called upon the name of the Lord. And then number three, we can also see the importance of family in the story. Naturally, people follow in the footsteps of their parents unless God intervenes, right? Many people say, oh, my dad does this and he's this and I'm never going to do that. And then eventually they start doing that. I'm always on guard what I say I'm not going to do that my father does. Because naturally, children imitate what their father does. As if you watch the children, they use the words that their mothers and fathers use. Also words they see on cartoons. But in general, we see them follow that kind of trend. They act like their mothers and fathers. So, let us... For those of us who had godly parents, let us thank God for our godly heritage. And for those of us who didn't grow up in a, in a Christian family, let us decide that we will start a godly heritage for our family, our future family, and those who will come after us. 
So let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you today and humbly kneel before you in, in reverence and acknowledge that you are God and creator of all things. Not only that, but you are our Jehovah, and we desire to pursue you because you have pursued us. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. I just pray that our lives would reflect the greatness of who you are and what you've done in our lives, Father. And Lord, I just pray that we would be people that would be known as people who call upon the name of the Lord, who seek you for our righteousness, who would call upon you in times of trouble, who would call upon you and give you praise. Lord, as we leave here today, Father, I just pray that you would continue to work in our lives, and may we be people who call upon your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to a time in our, our worship where we can respond to the Lord and